This is a course about the sample size uh, calculation for uh, experimental uh, experiments with animal research, and it is, it is not necessarily uh, linked to animal research. It can be applied to any other domain, but uh, all the examples have been taken from animal research. So, uh, when you design an experiment for uh, when you do a statistical design of an experiment, there are two main aspects that you have to that you have to address. One is the sample size, and the other one is the experiment design. So the experiment design is more about uh, identifying possible sources of variability, while the sample size is how many animals uh, do I need for to, to carry out my research. Both aspects are linked, although one doesn't imply the other. So uh, this course is only about the part of sample size. So this is uh, the general outline of, of this lecture today. And we will split the lecture in several videos. So we will not cover it, uh, the full thing, in a single video. And it is uh, about calculating this, the famous N, what, what number of animals I need. And if you want to dig into this, I would recommend you this book that uh, you can uh, find on the web. Or otherwise, uh, if you want to go more to the sources, you can uh, also use this one that is more uh, about uh, the mathematics behind this problem. Now, unfortunately, a sample size calculation is a branch of or statistics in general. It is a branch of mathematics, and sample size calculation is one particular application of this of a statistics. So there are a lot of formulas here. We will try to hide them and to give a bit the intuition behind them, but uh, we cannot avoid having some formulas. Okay, so why this course? So let's say that you are developing a new vaccine and you want to show that the new vaccine is effective. And to do that, you will use some mice and you will infect them and expose them to the virus and, and then see if they get infected or how much, uh, how sick they get. And if you use too few animals, it is a waste of time, your time, and, and money, uh, that is the, the funder's uh, money. It is also unethical because uh, you're doing bad things to animals that at the end will not uh, help to show that the treatment that you are doing is effective. The problem of using too few animals is that they the experiment has too little statistical power that we will learn later what it means. Uh, but basically it is that when you go to analyze the data, uh, you can never be sure that, the differ uh, that there is a significant difference between the vaccinated and the non-vaccinated group. Using too many uh, animals uh, it's also a waste of time, a waste of money, and again, it is unethical. So if, if you design a, an experiment with too many animals, for sure you will be able to see every minute uh, difference between groups, but uh, it is unethical because uh, you could uh, have done it with many less, uh, with many fewer animals, and and show a still and a still show the same effect. So you just need enough. There is another way of thinking about this problem of how many animals. That is this one. So uh, there are two uh, implied costs by. Uh, an experiment. One of them is linear with the sample size. So you have to um, maintain the animals, you have to feed them, you have to give them the vaccine, you have to measure. All that uh, grows linearly with the sample size. The more animals you have, the more uh, costly the experiment is. So this is this part. On the other side, you have another coast that is much more difficult to measure that has this shape. So this shape is the uh, 
cost of taking an incorrect decision. So let's say that uh, you have a very high sample size. So if you have a high sample size, there is very little probability that you make a false positive or a false negative. That is, uh, let's say that you are talking about the vaccine. So there is very little probability that if the vaccine is, is effective, you miss that effect or on the contrary, if the, uh, the vaccine is not effective, you think it is effective. And then uh, the larger the sample size, the, the smaller the probabilities of making these mistakes. But if you have a very small sample size, then you may be unlucky with your samples and simply because of variability of the observations, you may think that uh, the vaccine that is effective truly effective, you may think uh, it is not, and then you would miss a very useful tool, uh, biomedical tool, that is this vaccine. And, and you would have uh, incurred into high cost, simply uh, the, the cost of missing this, this uh, vaccine, simply because you were unlucky in your first experiments. And on the contrary, uh, maybe the, the vaccine is not effective but you have been again unlucky with your with your samples and then you think it is effective and then you go on into more and more research just to see to characterize this vaccine and, and at the end you are losing again time and money and uh, mouse lives for a, a product that is not working so the probability of making these mistakes, false positives or false negatives, are larger when you have very uh, small sizes. So the total cost of the experiment is the addition of these two curves. So there is a minimum region. So this region is ar around 20, 20, 25. So it doesn't mean these this, uh, numbers are not written in stone. So it is not that it is uh, 22 and not 23 and not 21. Uh, it is that in the range of 20 to 30 animals, it, it is uh, good enough to show what you want to show. So uh, this 20 to 30 means uh, that it is not 5 and it is not 90. So uh, it is just in that range, uh, 20 to 30, that you have to test. And for each experiment, this curve is different. And, and especially this part is very difficult to compute. So uh, you, you cannot uh, have it. But uh, at least the intuitive idea that the sample size is a region is, is I think, uh, important. So there is an unfounded fear by many researchers that if they try to do a statistical design of the experiment, it will require thousands of mice. Reality is that the statistical design uh, is related to five variables that we have called here relevance, variance, number of samples, significance, and, and power. And these five variables are such that if you change uh, one of the, uh, f if you fix four of them, the last one is automatically determined. So uh, there are uh, two kinds of constraints when you do an experiment. Some of them are experimental. And, and you know them better than I do. The other ones are statistical, and these are the ones that are covered by this course. So the experimental constraints can be, you need a minimum amount of material to perform your experiment, and then uh, you need a, a minimum number of animals, or some animals die or disappear, or they fight each other, so you cannot use them uh, for uh, for your measurements, and uh, the reason for this uh, disa uh, uh, disappearance is unrelated to your treatment. Uh, maybe you cannot handle more than I don't know 100 mice at a time or whatever number of mice at a time. Uh, sometimes the treatment is not so well applied because the mice move while you are injecting or whatever. So. The experimental constraints uh, for uh, typically these ones uh, uh, translate into dropouts or maximum 
number of animals or things like that. And the other ones, uh, the statistical ones, are related uh, about how the data will be used. These ones, the experimental, uh, will be about how the data is collected and then how the data will be used. So you will use the data to perform a comparison to a control group or you will compare the mean of two groups or these two groups are independent or they are dependent or the data is normally distributed or this is the first experiment ever so you don't know what the variance is and you want to estimate the variance so uh, we will address this second kind of constraints so here i'm describing uh, a typical situation uh, when researchers have to fill these forms for the ethical committees and, and uh, for instance uh, they arrive to the statistician and they say okay I have been told that I have to talk to you to write in this form the number of mice uh, for my experiment I have enough with 3000 so 3000 uh, sounds uh, like a lot but let's see that there is some reason for this okay so 3000 Okay, so what the researcher is typically thinking is that uh, he hates all this writing for the ethical approval of, of experiments. All, all he cares is about uh, performing the experiment and, and, and seeing what comes out, uh, the excitement of science. And why should he bother about talking to a statistician that doesn't know anything about his experiment, biology, or anything related. Okay, so you may be right, and then the experimenter is very happy, or you may need less animals, so some of you, uh, you may lose some of your time, some of your money, and some mice lives. Uh, so, or maybe you need more than 3,000, and then it is not that you lose uh, some of your time, money, and my lives. It is that you lose all of them because you never are a, you are never able to show that what you are uh, the effect of your vaccine or your treatment is is effective. Okay, so why don't you calculate how many animals you have? Uh, what are you doing? Okay, I'm studying how the area of a lesion changes with a new drug, and are there previous experiences? Of course, there is no previous experience. This is novel. This is science, and uh, if I, if it is not novel, I wouldn't have anything to publish. And this is a very stupid question. So uh, he he's confirmed into the idea that uh, talking to a statistician is not a good idea. Okay, so there is no previous uh, information at all. So. Um, do you, do you know if this lesion that uh, you are uh, studying, that is in the skin, is uh, is of a size of about 0 0.1 millimeter squared, or it is 10,000 millimeter squared? That, that is much bigger than the mouse. Okay, no, it has to be around 50 millimeters squared. So now you know the mean of one of the of the groups. The control groups typically is very well characterized because it is uh, used regularly in many experiments of the same kind. And then, when would you say that the drug is interesting? And then, okay, I don't know. I just want to see what comes out from the experiment. Uh, okay, so l let's say that the lesion area decreases from 50 to 49.5. Would you still say that your drug is worthy? Uh, if, it, if it makes such a small uh, decrease, even if it is statistic, statistically significant, it is not relevant biologically. So you cannot do anything with this drug. You cannot sell it to anyone. No, for instance, uh, I would say that it is interesting if it decreases the area by least a half so let's reduce it from 50 to 25 so now you have something that is called effect size this is the relevance of your experiment so it doesn't mean that uh, the drug that you are trying will do or will not do the, this uh, will cause or will not cause this decrease it means that if it happens then you want to see it with a given uh, uh, probability of false positives and false negatives 
and then uh, what kind of fluctuations do you expect around 50 mm squared in the control group and in the treatment group? And uh, okay, I don't know, the science is new. If it is not new, I wouldn't have anything to publish. So, yeah, this is, I don't know. Uh, okay, but uh, for instance, there are two kind of situations. In the first situation, you have uh, fluctuations of this kind where you have uh, the, the mean is 50, but you have values like 50, another animal is 49.96, 50.14, 50.14. So all these numbers they are very close to 50. The variance is 0 0.1. However, uh, you may have another situation in which the, the animals give these measurements 58, 8, 32, 22 and and yeah, they have much more variance the variance is is a thousand and and the mean is also 50 uh, finding uh, or detecting a, a change of 25 in this first situation it is extremely easy with just one animal if in the control group all the animals fluctuate like this and you f and you apply the drug and the drug uh, makes the lead, the area to drop to 25 with just one animal you see it if in the control if it control is is like this and and uh, it, the drug is effective and it drops to 25 it is much more difficult to detect it you can see that even in the control group there are some animals that have a value that is below 25 already so for instance this animal is 8 this animal is almost 22 so it is much more difficult to detect a change of 25 in this group than a change of 25 in this group or, or similar group I mean okay I don't know okay so if you don't know and you uh, stay in that position that you don't know don't know don't know then there is no other way than performing an exploratory experiment with a few animals and then repeating the experiment design with the results it is like if you have to to design an elevator for uh, aliens and you um, you want it for 10 aliens but you have never seen ever an alien so you uh, there is no way that you can design such an elevator the only way is that you perform an experiment you find a few aliens you measure them you see how uh, which is their weight and then you can design the elevator for those aliens but if you don't know anything at all about your about your uh, animals and the responses that you expect to have then it is like designing the elevator for aliens okay well there is a paper where they perform something similar to my experiment but with a different drug and they report the variance of a thousand and for the treatment it is less clear because uh, because uh, the treatment is really new so the control groups are typically well characterized because they are used in other experiments but the, the treatments it, it is true that uh, uh, they they are new so this variance uh, is uh, so let, let, let's say that we assume the same variance for both groups and typically it depends also on what you are measuring if the the variable that you measure in the treatment is expected to decrease the variance also typically decreases and on the contrary if the variable that you're measuring is expected to increase in the in the in the treatment group the variance may also increase and you also you may include kind of safety factor like when you are designing an, ele an elevator so you can say okay no I, I i don't know what will be the variance in the in the treatment group so just in case i will consider 20 or 30 percent uh, larger variance just in case that that happens okay so let's say that you uh, are happy with a, an increase of 20 percent of the increase and and then so we have uh, already fixed the relevance this is the effect size we want to detect 25 millimeters uh, of change and then the variance how f how f uh, much the observations fluctuate around those means now it comes uh, two technical va uh, variables the first one 
is a statistical significance, the other one is a statistical power. And statistical significance is related to the false positive uh, rates. So what is the probability that uh, you want to, uh, to have to think that uh, the drug is effective when actually it is not. So the null hypothesis, and we will introduce all this terminology later, but the null hypothesis is that the drug is not effective. If you reject it, you think that the drug is effective. But let's say that it is not. So how likely you want that uh, to happen? So uh, typically you choose 5% where you have all read these confidence levels of 95% and, and no, no one argues this because uh, this is the custom in biomedical sciences so 95% is, is fine and the other one a statistical power is less known statistical power is related to the other kind of errors so maybe the drug is effective truly effective but because you have been uh, unlucky with your samples you miss it so you are not able to show that it is effective and and how often do you want that to happen typical powers are uh, 90 80 percent so meaning that the probability of being wrong is 10 or 20 percent respectively so this uh, this uh, new uh, probability is, is called beta and you don't want it to be too high so let's say that the, you have very little power you have only 10% of power meaning that uh, you have a probability of false negative of 90% that would mean that in 90% of the experiments in which your drug is effective you would not be able to show that it is effective. So for that, I wouldn't do any experiment at all because anyway, 90% of the times I will say it is useless. So for that, I don't test it. So you, you want to have enough power. Um, okay, so let's say that you want to be very sensitive. So you, you uh, put this uh, power to only 10, uh, the power to 90% and the probability of being wrong, 10%. Uh, the more power you want to have, the more nice, uh, the more mice you will need. Okay, so then the formula to calculate the sample uh, size is something like this. It is not exactly this, but you can get it uh, uh, more or less. So uh, it has th uh, uh, four terms, uh, or th yeah, four terms. One is related to the confidence level, so the probability of making a false positive. The other one is related to the probability of having a false negative. The other one is what do you want to detect and uh, the variability of those uh, measurements. This is uh, the simplest formula you can have for, uh, the, uh, for, uh, for sample size calculation. And, and uh, for some researchers, this, this looks too complicated, but you don't have to worry about the formula itself. Actually, the formulas can be much more complicated, but they are implemented in programs. So you don't need uh, the you don't need to to implement this yourself. So uh, at the time, I was given an Excel file to make these calculations, but now we have programs, and I'll show you later in a in a another video I will show you one of these programs okay so let's good news you only need 31 mice in each in each group on um, and so you have fixed these four variables and then you are able to compute the, the fifth one okay but uh, sometimes uh, animals get a cold or die from something different not related to my experiments and or for any other reason they are useless how often does it happen? So it happens 20% uh, of the times. Okay, so then you need to increase the 31 animals by a factor such that when you lose these 20% uh, of animals, still you get the 31 that you need 
for your comparisons. So uh, the, the right calculation here is 31 divided by 0 0.8, that is the complement of 20%. So that gives you 39 animals per group. And if you if you lose 20% of these 39 animals, you still have 31. Uh, okay, I also want to test several drugs. And then uh, let's say that you want to repeat, uh, so you have 39 per group, you have two groups, so you have uh, s uh, 78 animals, or let's say 80 to put an easy number, and you want to repeat this uh, 40 times because you want to try 40 uh, different drugs. And then this 40 times uh, 80 is uh, 3200. So those are the animals that uh, he was asking at the beginning, so 3,000. He was not a crazy researcher, he just uh, needed uh, 3, uh, to repeat that experiment with many different drugs. Um, but if you are doing uh, 40 experiments of the same kind, the, the probability of, of having a false positive is increased. This is called the type 1 error inflation. But uh, we will see it later also along the course uh, why this happens. But uh, a very easy way to correct for it is this uh, so-called Bonferroni correction. So Bonferroni, you may have heard of it. And it is simply if you are doing 40 experiments, then instead of using alpha, that is typically 5%, you use 5% divided by 40. So uh, you increase the sample size of each one of the individual experiments, but you are sure that overall the family of tests that you will be doing has a low uh, probability of false positive. Uh, actually, this is one of the most advocated uh, measures that are currently uh, promoted to increase reprodu reproducibility in science. Okay, so what happens if you uh, if you get an, an unreasonable number of mice? So you let's say that uh, 39 is still too many. You you cannot do experiments with 39 animals. So you have to sacrifice something. You have to change something because if you fix four of these variables, a fifth one is automatically calculated. So you have to change something in these four variables. Significance is something that that you cannot touch because it is true that uh, in the biomedical literature you cannot publish anything with a significance of 10%. Uh, power you may sacrifice a bit, but uh, if you make your your experiment with very little power, then you you would miss many useful results. The variance you cannot touch much because it is the variability of the observations that. Uh, are coming from your samples and what you can touch is the relevance so uh, maybe if 25 uh, a change of 25 millimeters is uh, is is giving a very high number of animals in this case 31 and you want to reduce that the, the 31 you want to make it smaller then you will uh, lose sensitivity. So the changes that you will be able to detect are, are not 25 anymore. They will be larger changes. So the, the lesion area has to drop from 50 to, let's say, uh, 10. So there is a change of 40, which is a much bigger change. So with if you use fewer animals, either the drug is very, very effective or you will not be able to detect the change. Um, okay, so uh, I've been told that I have to replicate uh, the experiments three times so that the result is, is uh, uh, statistically significant. Okay, that is not uh, totally true. That depends on so uh, that depends on the p value and and two conditions, so there is, uh, there are two, um, there are two uh, effects that may affect your your uh, results. One is variability, that is the one that we have been talking about in the last slides, and the other one is bias. 
So maybe when you do your experiment, you do something wrong or uh, inadvertently un you do something different that the difference between the control and the, and the treatment is caused by this other reason and not by the control or treatment. So, uh, so to avoid that, that situation is called bias. So to avoid bias, it is true that it is good to repeat the experiments just to make sure that there is that the the result is reproducible. But uh, then the right way of dealing with bias is to think of an overall experiment. So let's say that we had 39 uh, animals. So 39 animals, you want to repeat it uh, three times the experiment. So instead of making 39 times three. Uh, so having, I don't know, 120 animals, what you do is 39 divided by 3. So you divide your experiment in three mini-experiments. Each, each one of the mini-experiments uh, uh, will contribute with a, a part of the total experiment. So by dividing into mini-experiments that are performed independently, you are able to detect the bias and still you have the control of the variance given by the sample size calculation. The, uh, the other, so uh, that is one of the reasons to repeat the experiment, to avoid bias. The other one is, is variance. So let's say that after the, uh, doing the experiment you get a p-value that is very close to your threshold. So the, the, or the Let's put it differently. You get a p-value that is 10 to the minus 10. So uh, the, the difference between the control and the group and the treatment group are so large that it doesn't matter how, many, how often uh, you repeat the experiment, you will always get some significant results in the absence of bias. So if the p-value is very small, you don't need to repeat the experiment if you are sure that you don't have bias. And if the p-value is close to the to the threshold, so if it is, uh, let's say, 0 0.499999, it is very likely that if you repeat the experiment now, instead of falling on the significant side of the threshold, you fall into the non-significant side of the threshold and you get 0 0.05 or 0 0.00001. So actually, if you are at the threshold, if the p-value is alpha, the probability of falling in either side of the threshold is 0 0.5. So uh, if you have a value, a p-value that is alpha divided by 10, still you have a, a, a probability or you have a probability of 80% to get the same result if you replicate it if there is no absence, uh, if there is no bias. So actually if you are interested in this uh, effect, uh, so of how uh, likely it is to get significant results once you have a given p-value, you may follow this article here. So in, in summary, uh, to design your experiment, you need to think about what is the relevant result that I want to detect. It doesn't mean that you will define it. It depends on <coughs> how effective your drug is. But now uh, you have chosen a, a, a compromise between or a balance between the sensitivity, so what do you want to detect, the probability of errors, false positive and false negative errors, and the sample size. And uh, th those are the light of the variability of the observations that you have. So uh, now you know what is reasonable to expect from your experiment. So if detecting a change of 25 requires 31 animals, but you cannot work with 31 animals, but you can only work with five per group, now you are aware that uh, you will not be able to detect changes of 25 millimeters squared at, with, with a, a statistical power of 90%. So you will only be able to detect with a statistical power, power of 90% much l larger uh, changes. 
So, and we have been only talking about the statistical aspects of your design, but uh, you have also to consider the experimental aspects. So, if you follow this methodology, uh, you are guaranteed to save money, time. So, uh, time is important to you, money is important to, to you and to your funders, and, and mice lives that are important to the animals because the, uh, the things that we need to do to the animals are not so pleasant, uh, but it is also true that uh, we cannot avoid them if we want to. Uh, to go with drugs, uh, so it is better trying with animals than trying with humans. So, and, and following this methodology, in the long run, you are guaranteed to save all these things. So after all, it was not so bad to, to talk to this statistician. Okay, so this would be all for this part of the video, so let's uh, stop it and and we continue in the next one.